Well, I've always worried about or wondered how you and Jordan, because mm-hmm. I feel like, especially some of his lead sounds, they're kind of in the same. Yeah. So how do you, do you guys consciously sort of carve out like sounds he can use to not compete with your guitar frequencies, or is it not even that big uh, of a deal? Or? The way that we approach this and and in producing Dream Theater, this this is something that I had to learn, um, and and once once we figured this out, it made all the difference. So. A guitar line, a single line, is just mono, right? And it's just coming at you there or wherever you put it. A synth lead sound is usually stereo. It's usually some right. kind of thing that's chorusy and it's doing all this stuff. And <laughs> so when we were to doing like unison lines, the keyboard would sound like hugely in stereo. Yeah. And and in a lot of ways, softer. It didn't have the uh, the cut of a guitar note, you know? And the guitar would be there, and it's like, even if you took the keyboard and like, oh, we'll pan him to the right, and we'll pan, well then the stereo sound is just like stacked and it sounds funny. So I was like, well, what if we just took the keyboard signal and treated it as if it was a guitar coming out of like a guitar player? Right. And we'll put that through. In fact, my plugin wasn't done yet, so on the latest Dream Theater record, we used the Pliny plugin we took Jordan's sound without any processing and we put it into the plugin. So now we had a guitar and a keyboard that were in the same space. And so now we can pan them and it works. Now we can put them on top of each other and it sounds just like two different players like Adrian Smith and Dave Murray play. Like <laughs> it doesn't sound like a keyboard guy who's like over here and then the guitar player's there. Adrian Smith or Dave Murray? I loved Adrian Smith. In fact, I love both those guys. Yeah. It's it's really hard to pick because yeah. Dave it just has some amazing leads. But the reason I, I have to say Adrian is because in the conversations about slowing down the records, Adrian Smith is the reason why I know what vibrato is today. I was learning one of his solos and it was slowed down and I'm playing the notes and all of a sudden I hear... <laughs> right. Yeah. Slow down. Half speed vibrato. Half right. speed vibrato with right. a guy who does a very wide vibrato and I was like... Like, That's that? how you do that. <laughs> Anytime Maiden hit New York, we go see them at the Coliseum or the Garden every single tour. Me and John Mayung wanted to be like Maiden or Rush. Like, that was our whole thing. What was yours, Susan? My what? But that's the equivalent band. Um, Dream Theater's one. <laughs> <laughs> uh, but you didn't learn vibrato from me. No. <laughs> I kind of missed the, the importance of focusing on it. And I think. It was interesting when you were describing learning guitar, and I'm I'm thinking like, whoa, he, he didn't know what a bend was. Yeah. And I'm like, there's no other guy. Like, usually there's a local teacher, someone in your high school plays, and I, no. I didn't think you would be coming from a vacuum of information like that. That's totally. mind blowing. Yeah. But I think part of the value of being in a community of players, especially guys who have been playing longer than you, is they can like kind of align you with like some of the foundationally important things. Totally. Um, vibrato totally. is a huge one, mm-hmm. and I think I was always like enamored with like the techniques that were well beyond that. It's just like who's doing the wildest? Right, thing? right. And I almost like went straight to that. Gotcha. And so it's been this journey of like just trying to yeah find my own in a weird way. It sounds weird to say at this point, but it's like I think I kind of neglected yeah. it to a degree. Yeah. You you went on a path that made sense to you. Who cares? Yeah. You go back and then do it. Yeah, in yeah. some ways it's cool because now yeah. I'm, you know, finding value in something that for some people they they maybe stop thinking about in a while. Right. But yeah, I mean, there's a few formative bands. I mean, I remember so Liquid Tension Experiment. It was kind of like I had heard instrumental records, mm-hmm. but it was usually like a guitarist and then a backup band. Yeah. But this was like everyone in the band's insane. Right. And then the compositions were. <laughs> so I was like, oh, I, that's. That's the kind of band I want to do. Yeah. <laughs> so, because look, there's, you know, you're exposed to all this music, but every once in a while you hear something that you're like, okay, like this is really specific, but like I resonate with this to a degree that's beyond, you know, a lot of the other stuff that, you know, everyone else is. Totally. And you, you almost try, you almost like sort of like start to like mold yourself in a certain direction. So, Amazing. yeah. Liquid Tension and Dream Theater, and then Meshuga for like a lot of the more, like the heavier. And the the rhythmic the rhythmic vocabulary, and then yeah I don't know um, just like a lot of harmony from outside of metal, like actually yeah that's good. amazing. What, what about you, Devin? I think as guitar players it was KK Downing, because he was out of tune and had tons of echo on him, mm-hmm. and I was like I loved it. It mm-hmm. just sounded possessed. 
but then it was always you know it was all the musical theater stuff from the 70s was huge for me like West Side Story and Jesus Christ, Jesus Superstar. Christ Superstar it was yeah. huge for me right yeah. but I was a kid and it was Metallica and Anya and Def Leppard and King's X and you know all these things come together Anya was a huge thing for me I loved the album Watermark it was just so vast and beautiful and I I I, I I fell in love with that because I thought, well, if you could get that sense of grandeur in something that was had that sort of Metallica vibe to it, uh, yeah, that was a big thing. But for guitars, yeah, it was Kiki Downing, man. Oh, that's amazing. I just loved him. Yeah. Yeah, I hope I never meet him either. Yeah. <laughs> and Priest, I mean, talk about like one of the original metal bands, too. When they start, like late 60s? Yeah, that's the era. Yeah, right? Too. Yeah. Crazy. Were you a Glenn Tipton fan then? Or? Yeah, yeah. Yeah. Yeah, dude. Yeah. Yeah. It's funny, there's, every now and then they have guitar players that when they play, you think, yeah, that's how it should sound. And then when you go to do the same thing, yeah, you're not. like, I think I'm playing it. I'm right, playing exactly. It, but it doesn't, I always found that about Van Halen, too. Oh, yeah. There's always the one guy in town mm. that was the guy who could play all the Van Halen mm -hmm. riffs. And when he's playing, it's like, how did you, how, yeah. I know. It's like the connection of the pick. I totally. And the boss, the blue and white delay, and like, you know. <laughs> and then I played, it always just sounded like ham-fisted, like you're wearing oven mitts or right. something. Right. Yeah. Well, sometimes there's like a little tiny technique that you're not aware that they're doing. You know, I told this so many times, I'm repeating myself, but I remember trying to play uh, Paranoid and it not sounding like it. Yeah. And it was um, only until I saw somebody do it where they hammer on. Right. Like, down, down, like, <laughs> I was like, that's why I'm, that's like that little tiny detail. So the Van Halen guys, like, they figured out this little... Oh, well, Motorhead too. I remember yeah. loving that. It was just because it just seemed like at any time it could just self destruct. Yeah. And uh, the first guitar we had was a Sears. We got it from the catalog, like the little acoustic one. Yeah. But within a week, the neck separated from the oh, body. Oh, no. But if you had the strings, you could, as a yeah. 10 year old, you could make a, a vibrato or a whammy bar with it by just pulling the headstock in the body. Right. You go, oh, that's funny. <laughs> So that was breaks in half. Out of nowhere. <laughs> Somebody sent me a uh, YouTube video mm. of the drum room mics of Van Halen, of Eddie playing Eruption. Mm. And the fact that there was nothing really like that before that, right. it, it, it becomes even more mind-boggling. When you hear him talk about why he did things and how he came up with stuff, that kind of makes a little more sense because he was kind of, I guess, thinking very mechanically or practically. How could I do this? How can I make this happen? How could I go into this amp and make this? But you, I, you often think like, well, yeah, but how did you end up like playing that way? <laughs> like, right. Like, why is it so different? Why is it so vastly different than all the guys doing that at that time? Some questions, don't right? Have answers. But yeah, I think it's just he liked to party. <laughs> There you go. Yeah, well, <laughs> the answer to everything. Well, yeah. it, you know, you mentioning the mic, the drum mic in the other room or whatever, it's like, I feel like Eruption had to be played through a loud amp. Yeah, And, absolutely. you know, going back to the modeler thing versus mm -hmm. there's an experience of a loud amp that's going to, you're going to play in a certain way because yeah. it's like yeah. this loud amp that's almost, it's almost like a violent thing. Right. And it there's an energy that will express itself because of that that is very different than like studio monitors at like a reasonable volume. Right, right. And there's just it's yeah. quintessential to the electric guitar. 